It's basically a grocer's and a military technology at the moment. Uh, and there are, you know, something like 60 million RFID tags in use and more being made every year. You can buy a million of them for, you know, five cents a piece. So it's already pretty well established as a shipping technology, but it isn't starting, it hasn't bled over yet away from the kind of, you know, walled garden of Walmart and the military and into general practice. And the public doesn't know much about it. And generally, the tech art avant-garde is, you know, the first robin in spring. So, you know, that's why I'm kind of like hedging my bets a little. I want to see whether that particular area of practice starts going. Next slide, please. Okay, this would be my friend and colleague, Catherine Albrecht, who is the foremost anti-RFID campaigner in the world. Although she has some pretty stiff competition from the Germans with the uh, FOBUD group, F-O-E-B-U-D. Um, the FOBUD basically regards RFID as a kind of fascist imposition by uh, 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 grocery chains and other uh, privacy denying big government, big corporate, what, predators in their term, I would think. Whereas Catherine, who's also an, an electronic privacy advocate, uh, is also a Christian fundamentalist. So she actually believes that tagging of this kind is a mark of the beast and a sign of the oncoming end times. So this is Catherine attending my class at, uh, at uh, Art Center College of Design, and she's holding up a, a document I did explaining to my class how an RFID tag actually works. Um, now, RFID tags in the future probably will not work like this. This is actually a generation one RFID tag. But let me just run through this for you, since Catherine is kind enough to be holding it for us. <laughs> this, um, this little spiral next to her hand is the antenna. Now, when you fire a scanner at the tag, it soaks up radio energy from the scanner. Then it moves it through this little circuit, and it passes one way through the diode. The voltage builds up in the capacitor quite quickly. When the capacitor overloads, it goes through the tag and the transistor, and it beams out a short replying radio message, which is basically usually 16 digits. I mean, basically an EPC, an electronic product code. So you basically, you take the gun, you fire it at, a, at, a, at an object, and a serial number bounces back and is visible on the screen of your RFID gun. That's how it works. Uh, you know, and, and if no uh, radio beam is fired at it, it does nothing. It's completely inert. They cannot communicate with one another. They are called passive tags. And a passive tag of this design costs about five cents in tremendous bulk. And maybe 20 or 30 cents if you buy some really good waterproofed, solid, plastic wrapped. They come in various, uh, various, I don't know, makes and models now. This is one. This little object taped onto the front of my machine is a RFID tag. And it's a functional one, too, although its code has no meaning. It's just a toy a friend gave me. So uh, Catherine, who runs a site called spychips.com and has written a book called Spy Chips, which is really a devastating critique of the RFID <coughs> industry, is you know the major kind of anti-RFID player. Uh, she's... Uh, well, I don't know. She's got an NGO called Caspian. Uh, she's in a lot of demand as a public speaker. It was very kind of her to come down and confront my class because I was training them in, you know, how to, in the nature of the RFI industry. That thing you see behind her head is a kind of map of players in the RFID space. Basically, the entire American military industrial complex and quite a few, <laughs> quite a few EU hangers on. Not to mention the Chinese and a bunch of other groups, but this is Catherine, who, like many, many crusaders, is undauntable. She's a spark plug of a gal, and you know, great, great fun to hang out with. Uh, really, I mean, she's a dear friend of mine. I have to say, you know, we, we trade a lot of email. Um, next slide, please. This is her book. Uh, Spy Chips, How Major Corporations Government Trying to Plaque Your Every Move with RFID by Catherine Albert and her brilliant researcher, Liz McIntyre, who did really some terrific kind of journalistic style muckraking and going out and just finding the patents that had been filed by a lot of these RFID pioneers. And of course, in trying to cover every possible intellectual property 
market space, these guys came up with some of the wackiest possible applications. Just brutal. And now they're still going on. I mean, the head of Very Chips two days ago uh, uh, proposed on Fox News television that the U.S. should solve its imaginary immigrant crisis by injecting RFID tags into illegal aliens. Yeah, you're laughing, but he isn't. You know? and, and really, the Bush administration is nutty enough at this point to swallow anything. So there's a lot of grandstanding in this space. I mean, peculiar stuff is going on. You may note that I actually wrote the foreword to um, <laughs> Catherine's book here. There's also a Christian fundamentalist special edition of this book, <laughs> for which I did not write the foreword, <laughs> because I'm a radical atheist. <clears throat> you know, well, it's interesting. Next slide, please. Uh, I, I include these. I'm not quite sure why, but I just love the look of them. I was, you know, while I was teaching at Art Center, meanwhile in architecture land, these guys are doing futuristic models of computer-generated buildings. Now, this is a computer-generated building from SciArc. Another one there. Next slide, please. Okay. This is another such building. Now, should ubiquitous computation, pervasive computing, calm technology, these other sorts of things actually permeate the built environment in the way that zealots believe might be the case? I think this would be the kind of architecture we'd see about mid-century. You know, because it doesn't look like it could hold itself up. But that wouldn't matter, because the building is small, right? It would just have reactive sensors built through its entire structure. And if it began to sway a little out of true, it would just automagically correct itself. Right? In other words, it's just be like less mass, more data. You actually post-industrialize the very structure of buildings, and really, you know, all bets are off. I mean, you know, and I would, I would be guessing that for the 2060s, the 2070s. But this is kind of, you know, the equivalent of a science fiction writer in the 1930s going out and telling you about, you know, the super kind of Flash Gordon Ray gun structures, you know, of the kind which only caught on in Southern California. This is a Southern California building. They're very inventive there architecturally. This is Gary's hometown. You know, people who teach this third know Gary very well. <coughs> Gary designs his buildings with fabricators, as you may know, Cadia and so forth. Okay, he designs them with fabricators, but he doesn't actually embed operating systems into buildings. They don't reformat themselves on the fly. But, you know, why not? I mean, why are we merely shaping inert things and not simply embedding the process by which it is designed into the structure itself? How difficult would that be? You can see bits of this in the kind of organic modernism of, say, Santiago Calatrava, where he has the buildings with the ribs that open up, the sun goes down, and so forth. It can be made to pay. It's not necessarily very you know, energy expensive. Uh, in a heavily seismic area like uh, Los Angeles, it might make a certain amount of sense to build smarts into the spines of buildings instead of having to, like, clad everything and sheet steel and rod and so forth in order to meet earthquake codes. Why don't you just let the earthquake ripple right on through? You know? <laughs> <laughs> just, or just, you know, adjust and it sort of flies by. And I, I want you to keep in mind, you know, you are talking to a science fiction writer here, but this is not science fiction. These are architecture students, you know. And I didn't coach them to produce this. This is what's coming out of architecture schools in LA right now. And that's kind of my scheme on the grand scale. I wouldn't call that structure a spine, because you know, I think of spines as being basically everyday objects. And it's kind of ubiquitous computation in the service of sustainability, as I said. But there's no question that it could scale up. Uh, you know, this, the question is sort of like, how scalable is it? Uh, you know, my, my colleague who wrote, uh, who wrote everywhere, Adam Greenfield, he's an interactive designer.